Shut up and sit down. Hey guys, I'm Sai. Welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. Here on the channel, you can find podcasts, interviews, and content on a variety of subjects. We've got ongoing series on mental health, mental health in sport, conspiracy theories. Uh, we've got a new series on serial killers, as well as a monthly show on films and TV. We also have new guests on the show each week discussing all sorts of subjects, including wrestling, football, music, writing, and uh, lots more. Uh, you can keep up to date with the uh, the new guests and what's coming up on our Twitter page, which is at AceCast underscore Nation and Facebook, which is Facebook.com slash AceCast Nation. Uh, all the shows are available in video format at YouTube.com, Ace Podcast Nation and audio at all the usual podcasting sites, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all of those. So. Uh, today's episode is another one, another episode in our series on mental health. In this particular series, we feature different mental health condition each episode. We speak to medical professionals, uh, people who suffer or are affected by said conditions, family members, whatever it may be. Um, today's episode is focused on disassociative. I knew I was going to mess that <laughs> That's up. That's okay. <laughs> uh, disassociative identity disorder, uh, often referred to as multiple personality disorder. I don't pretend to know a great deal about this condition, but I am eager to do shows on various conditions and focus on as many of them as possible so that we can educate people, including myself, raise awareness, break down some stigmas, and most of all, hopefully help some people along the way. Uh, so today I'm joined by uh, Chris Itterman, otherwise known as uh, The Chris Is. Uh, thanks for joining me, Chris, and I am uh, really grateful for you coming on. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate being here. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, it's um, I've been looking like it sounds really weird when you sort of say like you're looking forward to sort of discussing mental health and stuff like that. But I am really passionate about mental health because I've been affected by it. My family's been affected by it. So it's something that I'm keen to do. And then when I came up with the idea of exploring and looking into sort of different conditions and uh, issues, and I was keen to, I think these days, the, the sort of the almost the stigma of the from people generally towards mental health has improved greatly compared to where it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But I still think there's a lot of work to do. And I help by like speaking about it and getting people on. Maybe we can help people understand, shall we say? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so DID, because I'm not going to keep trying to say it because I will just <laughs> but butcher it. Uh, Dissociative so identity disorder. Yes. Yes. It's, um, so I know a lot. You know, a long time ago, it was referred to as multiple personality disorder. You know more and I think it's I don't know if it changed or if it was always that way around but obviously like when I was younger that was kind of what it was always referred to as is is that actually is it this you know is DID and multiple personality disorder the same thing there's a lot of overlap but 25 years ago when the DSM-5 came out they changed the category from multiple personality disorder to dissociative identity disorder and they changed some of the criteria um, but not significantly. It's still, it's still basically the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if, um, like I, like I explained to you off air, some of the questions might seem like a bit sort of simple or a bit silly, but it's because I want to try and get my viewers and listeners to uh, understand it as best we can, um, if they're not familiar with the condition. So if we start with the sort of basics of it, um, what what is DID in your you know in your own words? Okay, so there's basically three main criteria. Um, it is a disorder, so it's it's um, clinical. Um, so the clinical expectation is three things: that you have many uh, presentations or identities of people who recurrently take charge of your body. 
um, and they have a certain amount of difference from each other. The second one is that there are memory issues of some type. Um, it can be amnesia for parts of your past, like you know you went to an amusement park, but you have, you know, when you were 15 and you have absolutely no memory of it. It would be very unusual for somebody who doesn't have an amnesia uh, problem to forget an event like that. So it would be inconsistent with normal forgetting. Um, and the third one is that it causes distress or impairment in their life. So if it doesn't, it doesn't qualify as a disorder. There's two exclusion criteria, which is just that it's not um, caused by uh, drugs, alcohol, or um, brain damage and so on, like medical, medical conditions. And the other one is that it's not something that's accepted in the person's culture, like um, some kind of spiritual experiences and so on in, in other cultures. Um, so that wouldn't be considered unless it was causing distress. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That's, that's the small rundown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, obviously it's an exceptionally complex uh, subject and condition. So it's, you know, we're not going to be able to go into every uh, sort of little bit, but we're trying, you know, or should yeah. you say, I'll try and do my best and you'll do lots of talking. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like... What would you say are the most uh, sort of common misconceptions about DID? Okay, so um, so let's see that um, the media tends to portray DID in like the worst light because it's often used for fictional villains, and it's um, it's a way of creating tension and stuff in thrillers. And so on, because like, you know, the best friend could be the evil person too. Um, but that's really an enormous misconception. It causes a lot of pain and suffering for people with DID because you come out to a friend and they think automatically that you're out to kill them or something. And um, it's really so not that. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's like a huge misconception and... Um, you know, I did like an hour and a half lecture on, on the myths that come out of the movies with DID. So I won't go into all of them, but yeah, that's a huge one. And it's a real like thorn in the side of all people, you know, who have this condition. Um, another is that it's always caused by childhood abuse, which, um, it's not completely untrue, but it's usually trauma. And so that, the distinction between the abuse and trauma issue is um, how the person takes it. So something that's traumatic for one person may not be for another. Um, is it done deliberately? Would it be abuse? It could be, but it's not always. So it could be medical trauma. Somebody could be trying to save your life and still traumatize you. Um, so an, an infant, a child, wouldn't understand why all these procedures are being done, they're being separated from their parents, you know, all for their own quote-unquote good, but it's still really incredibly traumatic. Um, so there's very many different types of childhood trauma that can um, kind of uh, foster the development of this issue. <laughs> yeah, I suppose one of the things, um, <clears throat> I, no, I haven't really, I hadn't really, uh, sort of thought of it from that point of view in terms of the when you mentioned the like the Hollywood and the films the way that like the person with sort of DID is always portrayed as as the villain or the ki the killer or the you know whatever it may be and that is quite a common sort of plot point or sort of plot device that they use um, so that must be incredibly frustrating. Uh, you know, for people like yourself, because when meeting new people, I'm guessing that it can sometimes be quite uncomfortable or a bit difficult when you've got it or when you're trying to tell them or you do tell them that you've got the ID. You know, I'm, su I'm sure it's not like always a fun thing, fun conversation to have with them. Um, and if they uh, are not familiar with it or they're not sort of clued up to what it is, they could base their entire knowledge of it on, you know, films like Split or there was another one as well. I can't remember the name of it now. 
Um, yeah, the, the recent they, one was glass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, split and glass. And there was another one um, a few years ago with Ray Liotta in. I can't remember what it was. Edward Norton was in it. But yeah, and like they used that as a big sort of plot twist at the end. And it's sort of like it's very negative portrayal. Mm -hmm. And obviously, yeah. millions of people see those every year or every time they come out. Um, and then millions of times afterwards on DVD and streaming services. Um, so that, like, that must be quite frustrating for you. Yeah, it is. And um, since you're in, in the UK, you might actually have heard about the Australian woman who had her father extradited from the UK to Australia to face charges of childhood of sexual abuse. Um, this is fairly recent news. Um, and the courts... Um, he, he admitted to it, I think, eventually. He actually uh, is in jail now down in Australia. Um, so most often what happens is we're victims. Um, they, they portray us in the media as, as being um, terrifying and uh, horrible people and that we're going to hurt people. But most of the time we're the ones getting hurt and we've been hurt repeatedly by sometimes the people closest to us, but sometimes just by life itself. Um, we're usually victims. We usually have really poor boundaries and get trounced in relationships or we, you know, like like anybody who's um, had not the best growing up. Sometimes we latch on to partners and spouses who are not the best match, you know, not the healthiest people, um, and recreate trouble for ourselves. So often we end up re-traumatized and, um, being a victim over and over again. So yeah, it's pretty damaging, but also you say, you know, meet somebody new and try and tell them, but this is, this can happen when you're telling your parents or when you're telling your siblings or you're telling um, somebody you've been friends with, your best friend for who knows how long, you come out of therapy sessions, you know, and finally decide you're going to come out as being different somehow. And just like any other kind of coming out, it can blow up in your face. And so those media portrayals really can can damage people. You know, they'll, they'll literally say, you know, oh my God, I got to get away from you. You know, I can't see you anymore. I can't, yeah. can't be your friend or... You're going to hurt me and and really get scared. Um, so, yeah, that can be traumatizing all over again. Yeah. Yeah, that is, it sounds, that sounds terrible, you know, like a terrible. I always think for anyone who's coming out to their parents or, you know, like you say, siblings, it can be, it's, you know, it's very painful just that build up to doing it and finally coming to terms with right i'm gonna tell my parents or i'm gonna tell my friends or whoever it may be and i always i always whenever i see someone who's you know on social media they've sort of come out or whatever it may be i always think oh, i'm really happy that they've had a good reaction because you hear of horror stories of parents disowning you know people yes. for being gay or trans and and i just think all the 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 mental turmoil that they've suffered up to that point of getting the confidence to come out to their like, parents family friends it, you know that's been a big build up for them they haven't just thought what you know they haven't just sort of happily been going along and then one day they thought oh i'm going to tell them it's been like something exactly. they've probably gone back and forth on mm -hmm. um it's that kind of like a similar thing it can be. It can be. People. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on how long we've known. You know, sometimes we go to therapy, uh, you know, somebody who we, we develop DID in childhood, but we kind of don't even realize it sometimes. We don't even know that we have anything going on. Um, we don't know why we don't remember last Thursday. We don't, you know, we have no idea what's going on. And we end up in therapy eventually, probably a panic attack nervous breakdown, depression, anxiety, you know, some of the usual culprits, um, we end up in therapy and maybe after who knows how many sessions, you know, it could be soon or it could be years in, um, eventually the therapist turns around and says, guess what? I think I figured it out. Um, you know, and, and tells you, uh, some of us figure it out on our own before therapy or during therapy. And then sometimes it's the therapist who's the first one telling you, um, 
So you may go home in a daze, in shock, and maybe even in denial um, and turn to family, friends, loved ones, spouse, whoever, and say, I can't believe the doctor said this. So sometimes you get confirmation from them, and sometimes you get shown the door. It's really horrifying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, i got to say, like, as a, as a parent, i got three boys, and I, I just think that no matter what they could tell me, I just don't think that I'd be able to sort of disown them or go that, down that route. Mm-hmm. And I've never been able to understand people who are able to do that because I just think, I don't know, there's just, it's like your children and you're supposed to protect them and love them. And, yeah. you know, you take them for what they are, no matter what. And that's where, if, that's where the, the stigma and the fear mongering, you know, of, of the media, both the news media, the fiction media, um, even some of the documentaries are not done in a very kindly way. Um, all of that adds up to an immense amount of fear about somebody who may know you one minute and may not know you the next, you know, because that does sometimes happen. You know, somebody can actually know you one minute and not know you the next. And there, that fear of, oh my God, what is this other person I don't know going to do? You know, it's like, I know you and I like you and they don't know, know how many people that is, but I know you and I like you, but what about all those other mysterious people who might show up? Um, I don't know them. I don't, you know, I don't trust them. I have trust with you and you could be 12 or 20 or 35 people who've been hiding out behind the face, you know, they, they don't know, but, um, yeah, they think it's just like you're one person and then there's this mystery other people that that who knows who they are. Um, it doesn't usually work that way. <laughs> but yeah. I've um, go, on. go ahead. I was just going to say I've seen people um, describe themselves or other people with DID as um, as a system. Uh, like is that sort of acceptable? terminology and what does it mean that is that is the preferred terminology within you know the whole of of uh multiples or what do you want to call it so a multiple system a did system um and some of us identify as plural systems so yeah there's um that's kind of been a term it kind of came out of psychology but that we've embraced um because it kind of um, well, if you go by systems theory, everything's a system, but also it, it implies that it can work together eventually, that it can operate as a whole. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, forward facing. It's not a stigmatizing, uh, ball and chain type of term. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so like we said, we just got sort of you discussed briefly about the sort of the, co- the causes of DID with um, it can be sort of trauma based or, or abuse, but it doesn't have to be sort of one or the other. Um, what is the is there like a like a general kind of age where it would be sort of diagnosed or it would start to manifest or is it literally could be anything from a very young child up to you know, so adulthood. it's usually developed in childhood, but can go quiet kind of um, like kind of like you have something in remission or it's kind of on the slides hidden from everybody, including yourself um, for years. So usually it's developed in childhood. It's quiet for a decade. Um, maybe some, you know, incidents during teenager stuff or maybe the abuse is still going on while you're a teenager. So there's still protectors and things coming out and, and defending you. But usually you don't know why you're losing time or what's going on and you kind of make do, you know, you cover it up um, just reflexively. And then sometime in the future, and it can be after getting married, having kids. I mean, there are people in their 60s and 70s who find out. Um, So it can go on for a very long time that way. Or some people figure it out in their late teens, early 20s, um, before they're married, when they're 
in college age or whatever. So some people are figuring it out on the young end, some figure it out on the older end. Um, and one of our beefs is that people who um, evaluate children and know the children have had extensive trauma aren't necessarily screening for it so that they can help as early as possible. So I think that uh, when a child is is known to come from an abusive household or they're a refugee or they've been trafficked, that they should be really screened and so they can get help as early as possible so that they don't go through that big denial period and come out on the other side going, oh, where did my last 20 years go, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, with any mental health condition, particularly like in children, the, the, I suppose any health condition, not just mental health condition, the earlier you can get it diagnosed, the quicker you can get treatment or therapy or, you know, whatever's needed to to help with the condition or the illness or whatever it may be. And <clears throat> like you say, if they were screening regularly in those young children, they're more likely to pick it up than sort of screening once and then that's it or leaving yeah. it for a very long yeah. period. And uh, like I, people could go through a long time thinking that there's like, like, like you say, they're losing time. They could wake up on a Monday and not remember the weekend but sort of just push it to the side and go about their day and whilst they might push that to the side if you keep losing time it is gonna play on your mind and it is gonna maybe cause other sort of mental health issues whether it be depression or anxiety and things because you're losing time and you know that something's going on yeah um, um well one of the core issues behind the the actual DID diagnosis is that we have PTSD. We have anxiety issues. We have, you know, all of the repercussions of trauma. Um, and re more recent studies are showing it's actual brain damage and it's, it's endocrine system damage and it affects your whole body. And so our body is holding all of this tension and this anxiety and so on. And it's not something that can, we can just think our way around and think our way out of it. It's really embedded in the body. Um, so the earlier it is worked with, you know, for those children, then maybe the more they can heal that, that damage so that the long-term effects of that PTSD don't get manifested because we have more autoimmune issues and we have more, um, like everything, um, all the body systems do worse with stress. So the more we're affected by stress and anxiety, the, the worse our body wears. We, we live less, you know, um, in, in terms of longevity. Um, we have more diabetes or more heart disease or other congenital issues or uh, hereditary issues will rear their head and, you know, a diet, like all these, all these things. So what we need is, is more healing earlier so that maybe the effects of the stress on our body and our brain can be you know, worked through earlier so that we don't have that. But um, what else is it going to say? <laughs> we were going to say something else. We don't know. So, yeah, go ahead and ask your questions. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, so would, so what, like, once someone's been diagnosed with DID, um, is that it for life then? in terms of they'll they will always have it or can it kind of come and go or does it I, do you know what i mean it i'm not sure whether it's so what's the prognosis of it? yeah yeah what where does it go from there um so there's like a um there's kind of um an agreement between professional people about kind of a path of healing um which is to work on stabilization because often like I said, you know, you'll come into therapy and you'll be really depressed. You'll be anxious. You'll be freaking out. You'll have panic, panic attacks and so on. So the first thing to do is stabilize somebody. Um, suicide attempt rate with people with DID is 70 plus percent for one or more attempts. Um, and that's those that actually get a clinical diagnosis. So we don't know how many people die before they get a diagnosis. We have no idea. So, yeah, we're we're dying. 
um, and we're trying to die. So it's really, we're hurt. We're really, really deeply hurt. And so it's a matter of stabilizing them. That's the first stage of therapy is stabilization, you know, working on that depression, working on the suicidality, um, maybe making sure that home life is safe, um, you know, and other things that the therapist will work on, as well as building rapport with the therapist because the next two stages are so, um, what do you want to say? It requires such a level of vulnerability of the the client. So it's really necessary to have a good relationship with the therapist to work on the next two stages. So then the next stage that they talk about is um, trauma work. And so they go through a cycle of stabilizing somebody, working on trauma, sta stabilization, trauma. Because sta every time you work on the trauma, you're digging up something awful and you're working on it it destabilizes the person again. So they kind of flip between stage one and stage two back and forth for a while. And then the final stage is working more on coping mechanisms for going back into the world, you know, outside of therapy, um, working skills, home skills, um, and whether or not the client wants to attempt something called integration or merging or unification, um, which is an attempt to get everybody to be one person again. Some people with DID have a strong sense of they were once one and fell apart. Others don't have that. So there's like no idea of what to become again. So for some of us, we choose to live this way um, for life. And um, so throughout the whole process, all three stages, there's work on communication and community inside, working on rules and um being able to have meetings and, and talk to each other so that we can live a shared life because the, unfortunately this three stage process takes probably eight to 10 years on average. So sometimes it takes even longer. So we have to live together during this. It's no, there's no quick fix. Um, you don't go in therapy and then like, you know, like a year later, everything's all good. This is really, it's grueling. Um, which is why I, I really want, earlier intervention when it's not as grueling and maybe there's not as much stuff to go over and maybe easier to work with people and so on, you know, work with children before it's quite so advanced. Um, but yeah, so it's a long process and in, on average it takes eight to 10 years just to get the diagnosis. So you're talking like 16 to 20 years uh, ish. Yeah. That's a long time, isn't it? To sort of, 16 to 20 years just to get your diagnosis and then work through you know the necessary sort of therapy if you like that's a long long period of time isn't it and like you yeah. said I'd imagine that is extremely grueling and as in you know any sort of therapy for any sort of uh, mental health condition where you're discussing traumatic events or things that have happened to you or things that are you're struggling with when you come out of it you can feel like an emotional wreck speaking from personal experience you know when i when i went to some therapy a couple of few, few years ago and i discussed things that i had not discussed ever since i was a sort of teenager and i came out of it and i on one hand i felt relieved for talking about it but on the other hand i just I felt like a wreck because if you just dredging, dredging, I don't know if dredging would be the right word, but you like you're bringing up everything which happened previously, and as well, you know, as well as just you, you can't just talk about those things without bringing up the emotions attached to those memories mm -hmm. and those things as well, which you know, and like you said, then I suppose that would be where you skip sort of back between the stage two and the stage one. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the, the danger is if the therapist pushes too fast or pushes to go for deeper traumas too soon that, yeah, it'll end up, uh, kind of snowballing. So between therapy sessions, the person has what's called flooding. So, um, tons of flashbacks and nightmares and, um, lots of PTSD and, so the, the goal of therapy usually, I mean, from a good skilled therapist, would be to work on what's ready to be worked on and, and try to make it 
as gentle as possible. I mean, obviously, yes, yeah, stuff's still going to come up, but to try and make sure that at least the person has the skills to cope between the sessions and, um, and not to bring up things before they're ready to be brought up. Really, you know, don't go for yeah. the worst thing first. Go for the low-hanging fruit and the smaller things that maybe working on those will make life a little bit more livable. Um, but, you know, not not going for the gold, you know, because that really, yeah. it's like it's like causing earthquakes, you know, in the system. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's about, as, as well as what you just described, is when you, you're trying to build trust with the therapist as well. So if you kind of go for this, like you, like you described, the little sort of low hanging fruit and you're sort of discussing these things and you're going back and forth, as you're doing that, the trust is growing and the trust is, you know, becoming stronger between you and the therapist or the person and the therapist. Whereas if they sort of go steaming in a bit like a bull in a china shop and go for the most traumatic sort of memories or whatnot I would imagine that I would put the person on the back foot a bit as well and they would yeah you know they'd be a bit more reluctant because they would feel uncomfortable you know yeah. at the end of the day to talk about anything traumatic or anything which is emotional or upsetting you have to be comfortable if you're not comfortable you're not going to be able to do it and if you don't trust the person that you're speaking to you're not going to be able to do it yeah, and that so, trust is so precious in that relationship that going in too fast, too far can also hurt the trust in the relationship. You know, there'll be people within the system. So I think of us as people, um, just yeah. to make that clear. So we're a bunch of people in one head and one body. But we have protectors inside because, for example, with our system, we had um, a lot of emotional abuse and verbal abuse as a child. So a therapist saying the wrong things or pushing in the wrong way emotionally can cause protectors for emotional and verbal abuse to come forward and try and protect us, you know. So, you know, if they're uh, pushing too hard, too fast, they may alert the whole system to kind of go into that defensive mode um, and block healing block you know block the revelation or maybe they don't you know not everybody in the system builds trust at the same rate also so maybe these people trust you but i don't trust you you know i'm a protector i'm not going to trust you so we get um internal conflicts sometimes where you know this group likes the therapist this group doesn't trust them yet and pushing too far too fast can also you know cause little rifts within the system of disagreement um yeah so those wouldn't be such a great idea. So yeah, like you were saying, that that trust building is so important, um, and yeah, to work on that. With them, um, in terms, is it just? Uh, I say just as if it's just as easy as that. But I, what I mean is, is, would therapy be the only treatment for it, or for DID, or would it be? Is there do they give medication, or is it just kind of? Um, the sort of therapeutic route and how trying to help people come to terms with, you know, their system or their situation or whatever it may be. So DID doesn't exist in a vacuum, unfortunately. So like I said, there's CPTSD or PTSD along with it. CPTSD is complex PTSD um, along with it. So you have anxiety disorders. So sometimes anxiety medication. Um, some people have more depression, so sometimes depression medication. There's no actual direct medication for DID itself, but for all the other things that come around it. And so many things can be, uh, so many different mental health disorders are caused by um, trauma that there definitely can be other uh, issues that occur with it. Um, so yeah, it doesn't exist like on its own and and many people with DID, one, one friend says something like, you know, get one diagnosis, get six for, th for free. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, sometimes we come with, you know, eating disorders or with um, uh, sometimes autism spectrum disorders or we have physical health disorders. Um, I know several people with DID who are blind. Um, there are many who are deaf, you know, and so on. So we have various um, issues and and there's trans people with the ID and there's um 
there's of course queer people with the ID and so on. So, you know, we get other, let's say complications of life, you know, where, where there's more than one thing to come out to people yeah, for course. and so on. Yeah. Okay. So if we could uh, move on to the sort of alters, if you like, would, it, would alters be the right term or personalities? Alters works. It works. It's um, sometimes people call them others. I like to call them headmates. Kind of like flatmates. I like that. I like that. Headmates. <laughs> yeah, That's good. Headmates. I really like that. I really like that. Yeah. So um with headmates, are they all protectors or would they it can just range to completely different personalities, genders, ages? Yes, they all, they all, you know, it's it's funny because I was recently thinking, you know, we all could be protectors, we could all be healers, we could all, but yeah, we generally end up in roles, just like in families and in, in work groups and so on. We all end up kind of fitting into niche, niches and roles and things. So um, yeah, we do generally tend to have people who fit more into protector roles and so on. And we do have a wide range of ages, genders. Not every DID or multiple system has all of these features. Like occasionally you'll find somebody who they're all one gender, you know, different parts of that gender spectrum, maybe, you know, but like say all females, but they're all a different range of females, but maybe they have no guys, no boys, no male children in their, in their system. So that can happen. Um, also not always human. So sometimes we need a protector and our, let's say we are being abused. Our abuser seems so big, so fierce that we need something bigger and fiercer than a really big and fierce human to protect us from them. So sometimes we have a dragon or, a, you know, something else, a demon and so on in our, our system as our protector. Um, and when you get to larger, more complicated systems, there can be many, not just one protector, but many, many protectors um, or healers or mothering figures or um, children. You know, we end up, usually most systems have children ranging in various ages, usually the abuse ages or the trauma ages of the body um, that are kind of stuck at various ages and stages of development. And, um, and teenagers and you know so we have littles middles <laughs> and bigs is what we call them in the yeah. community yeah so one thing i was wondering the other day um so like, like we said um, the headmates may not always be the same sex um so one thing i wondered and it could be a really like, silly question so i apologize um but say you had like a um a female female headmate, but the the host body is male. Um, could that in itself lead to mental health issues like depression or body dysphoria for that particular personality? Oh, absolutely. Or, yeah, because that must be like it. it it's very dis difficult. Yeah. Well, most I would say most of the headmates in almost any system have body dysphoria in the first place. We we have a lot of dysphoria because of um, trauma, you know, because of attacks on our body, because maybe we were sexually abused and so on. We end up with a, a good number of people who, even when the gender matches, the body is not what they feel is an expression of them as a person. Um, so not, yeah. you know like we may not be attached to our body. So a lot of people will say the body and and talk talk detached. You know, it, it's dissociative identity disorder, which means that we disassociate from a lot of things in reality. Um, so often we dissociate from our body. We push our body away. We don't treat our body very well. Um, we don't own it. We don't feel ownership of it. So we kind of went out of body to protect ourselves and we're kind of stuck here in this body. Uh, that's, that's kind of one of the ways of, of kind of looking at it. So it's not unusual to have the gender mismatch causing issues as well. Like you mentioned, gender dysphoria or um, 
you know, other, other issues, uh, depression. Yes. Anxiety. Some people get very anxious when they front because the body is so different from what they, they feel. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is quite common. And, and then there's the non-human alters. Like my body does not resemble a dragon. So it's uncomfortable if the dragon fronts, it's like, where are my horns? Where are my wings? Where's my tail? You know, like everything's missing. I'm, I'm up right on yes. two legs. What's going on? You know, it so yeah, feel it can right. feel weird. Yeah, it feels definitely weird and out of place um, for different alters to front sometimes. Yeah. So the the headmates obviously have got they, they've all got their individual uh, personalities and quirks, um, but wouldn't would that mean that they also have their own sort of sets of issues and problems which may differ? So maybe one per, one head may, may be suffering from sort of depression or an, an anxiety, whereas another head may, may be happy and doing okay. Is that possible? Or would they generally all tend to suffer with anxiety and depression and stuff like that? No, it can go all over the place. Um, different triggers, different um, coping mechanisms, uh, different outlook on life, different religions, different beliefs. Um, some may be coping quite well with life, others may not. Um, there's that person who thought they were running the show for however many years, you know, they're the one that maybe went to school or went to work um, and were holding everything together, even though they were missing the weekends or missing the evenings or, you know, things went missing or things were showing up in their closet that they didn't remember buying. Um, <laughs> like all the weirdness, you know, like they coped with it. They dealt with it. They're like, I don't know what's going on, but, and they just kept going. Um, you know, sometimes they, sometimes they get a uh, smack upside the head and can get depressed after figuring it out, but uh, feel like they're losing control of their life and stuff like that. But other times it's like, yeah, well, I'm still going to go go hold down the job and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to go to work and I'm going to take care of the family and we'll figure this other stuff out, you know. So it can it can really vary. Um, some people are just more resilient than others and, and some completely fall apart. Um, but over time, as more of us in a system get let's say, on the same page as we start communicating, uh, we start collaborating with each other. Generally, there's an overall improvement in life that, um, that we feel more in control, you know, that we can make group decisions, that we can, um, you know, hopefully eventually direct our life more and take more control um, and know why all these weird things were happening and prevent more weird things from happening in our life, like, you know, like no credit cards for the kids, you know, they can't go and buy all the, all the sweets at the store, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> things like that. Like take, take yeah. back control, you know? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, so when they communicate, like I'm not sure if it's different for different people. So when the, the uh, headmates would communicate with each other, would that be things like, leaving a note would that be sort of inside their you know inside their mind sort of talking back and forth or would that mean um like talking audibly out loud to each other how yeah. would they generally communicate and can they is that always possible for every person with the id or does it take work or it's different for everyone it's different for everyone. Um, we were a high, what we call co-conscious system from the start. Like we remember hearing each other internally when we were 10 years old, we could hear different tracks of thought and tra some of the tracks were responding to each other, but we weren't really having a conversation. Um, and then when we were 16, we introduced ourselves to each other internally, um, mental thoughts, you know, speaking to each other in our head. Um, but some sometimes we do talk out loud and <laughs> and we do write notes or we um, use a document and we'll talk back and forth typing. Um, you know, so there's different methods that we all use. The leaving notes is one that um, works really well for some systems, like having a whiteboard or post-it note on the fridge or whatever. Um, sometimes they do leave each other notes 
because they have they still have the um, amnesiac walls between them. So it's good to know somebody needs to go and buy milk, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's good to leave each other notes. Um, and it is a process. Most systems can always improve on communication uh, from wherever it is they're starting. And so those who have zero communication to start with, you know, start with the simplest things like note leaving and uh, sharing a journal, you know, and please, you know, make sure you write your name and the date and write whatever you want for us to read. Um, and uh, what else? You know, there's, there's um, sometimes you lose time when you're in therapy. Somebody else came out and is talking to your therapist. <laughs> you wake up and it's the end of the session. It's time to go. And you don't know what happened in your own therapy session. You know, so those are like, uh, you know, it can make it difficult to, to communicate so, when, when the system doesn't have communication. Yeah. Do the, do the, do the headmates always get along? No, nope, they don't always get along. Um, sometimes they can be polar opposites from each other or have large, large disagreements. Um, sometimes somebody really wants to control the life and make it all theirs uh, to the exclusion of everyone else. And, you know, there's no real way to do that. So uh, whether it's the person um, who was running the life wants everybody else to go away so they can resume their life, uh, they kind of feel like these are encroachers or trespassers on what was theirs or what they think was theirs um, versus other people who may have been in the background who may decide, look, time is up, you know, I want my time in the spotlight or, um, you know, it's, you're, you're not running this life very well, I want to take over uh, or whatever it is. Yeah, sometimes there's, and, and I do a lot of work, I have a website, kinhost.org, where we do a lot of work on internal communication, internal community, um, self-help stuff, you know, just to help people build communication and get along better uh, inside. So that's that's really our niche. We we feel very passionate about that. We really think people could get along and share their life. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I'll um, I'll put links up to your website in the description when I post the video as well, so yeah. people can go and uh, have a look. Um, so another thing which I wanted to ask, actually, this was asked to me to ask you. Um, so I, again, it might be like a silly question, um, but they asked me if they were speaking to someone with DID and the person they were speaking to uh, switched to a different headmate, what should they do? Should they acknowledge the switch should they carry on the conversation or something else or would that be unlikely to happen unless there was like a need to sort of protect or the person was uncomfortable or sad or threatened or something like that yeah so it depends where that particular system is uh we switch fluidly all the time so okay. we'll be literally writing um, if we're handwriting something, we'll see the, the, the handwriting switch mid sentence, you know, we are like, Oh, somebody switched, um, you know, or, or somebody took control of the pen and started, you know, finishing a sentence. But, um, so in conversation, we can switch very fluidly. So most people outside of our body don't notice so much unless there's a drastic change in our voice or our posture or, or the person really knows what to look for. Um, but if it's somebody who has higher amnesiac walls and you know this, it might be nice to say, hi, welcome to the room, you know, or, you know, yes. something like just to acknowledge like, hey, you know, do you remember what was going on? You know, just to because um, it can be really disorienting um, to come in in the middle of the conversation and be trying to fake that you were there the whole time. <laughs> so, yeah, because yeah, 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 a lot of us mask. So this is. um a term also used in autism that we try to pass as being quote unquote normal. Um, and not that there is a normal, but you know, to be passing as a singular person. So we, we try to conform to society and society's expectations of us. So we will bend over backwards to keep appointments, to, to try to remember things, to cover up when we forget things, to, 
cover up switches um, to all seem like the same person or use the same name in public um, so that we don't get outed, you know, unless we choose to be. Um, so we're always like, I guess, um, covering things up to be a happy medium, you know, to be somewhere in between everybody as much as possible or um, always be somebody that everybody else could fake being. Um, we have something we call the Chris mask. So Chris is nobody in here. Chris and the Chris's is all of us. We all answer to Chris. So we're all the Chris's. Um, we all have different names, you know, within our system. Yeah. All of our headmates are, have different names and identities. But when we pick up the phone, we don't know who's on the other end. We're always ready to be Chris um, and fake, fake it till we make it. Uh, <laughs> so that's, it can be, it can be a struggle. So if you, if the person has told you that they're DID and you know this for sure, for sure, maybe have a conversation with them about how they would like to be, yes. you know, dealt with. Um, are you guys co-conscious? Can you, you know, do you know what's going on? Um, being co-conscious is kind of like if you're standing at a window and everybody else is standing behind you and looking out the window. So they kind of know what's been going on. <laughs> if the okay. window were your eyes, you know, so everybody else is kind of right there and they're aware of what's going on. <laughs> um, they've got the cliff notes at the very least. So they can kind of seamlessly um, take over different situations. Um, the more amnesia barriers there are between the headmates, the more confusion there can be when they, they switch. It's, you know, not knowing what was happening last week oh, or shit. yesterday or five minutes ago. Yeah. I guess um, <clears throat> for people with DID as well, they get used to covering up and oh, yeah. uh, masking it. So they would probably become, you know, by adulthood or when they've been dealing with it for a long period of time, they become very good at it. Um, so, so when you mentioned that, it sort of interested me. Um, you said that you were a you you switch like fluidly, um, and you were co consciousness. So um, can I ask, have you switched during our conversation? You don't have to answer. I just wondered. It was just something that sort we of. Pro we, probably that. <laughs> we probably have. We probably have. We probably have. We don't pay that much attention. But we. Yeah, yeah, of course. We have kind of like a revolving door or we call it a do -si do So it's like somebody yeah. taps us on the shoulder and we just step aside and let them slide in front, you know, kind of like back to the window. You know, it's like, hey, could I get in front? Yeah, sure. And just move over. And let them be in front of the window. Um, so we've gotten to the point where, I mean, and we're 33 years in from when we first introduced ourselves to each other. It's 33 years ago. Um, so it took time to get to that. We used to switch from triggers. So something would happen and we'd switch. And if we wanted to switch on purpose, because we did know about each other, um, if we wanted to switch on purpose, it would cause headaches. It would, you know, it would be difficult it would take us a couple minutes to do it you know like how do I get out of the way I don't know you know so we, we would like struggle to do it um yeah okay um so just to finish off would you mind if I asked you some questions about your headmates or would you rather not oh I don't mind discuss them no I don't so, mind I just want to check that. I should have checked before. Really. Um, so how many headmates do you have? We have about 20 some odd that front frequently. And then um, we have uh, bits and bobbles and various things. Our, our head count by psychology terms is probably about 110 total. Um, yeah, but mostly it's like 20 or so people who will take front. So would that mean that you would hear like those 20 people would be talking to each other within your mind at the same time or would it not be because I would the reason I ask I would imagine that would be quite intense to have sort of 20 voices having 20 people having a conversation all at once um yeah a lot of us don't um Firstly, we don't talk on top of each other, you know, we take turns yeah, like most people do in a conversation. But yeah, yeah, I don't think most of us participate in all the conversations. 
like usually it's it's smaller groups. We break into subcommittees, really, and that's what we say. You know, we break into subcommittees. This subcommittee is going to go off and talk. You know, talk about that, and this one goes over there and talks about this. Um, and then we come back together as a group and have a meeting and, you know, the subcommittee will bring their ideas or, you know, hey, these are our suggestions and we'll, you know. So we actually have meetings. Um, and our, you know, our usual fronts, like maybe two to five people a day, you know, it's not usually like 20 or like going through the, the revolving door every day, but there are 20 people who traditionally have taken front, you know, over time um, in our system. Okay. So what about um, the sort of, uh, like, the ages of them? Is there, like, a vast difference in the different, in those sort of 20? Or are they all sim sort of similar ages? Well, okay. So a great example right now is we have a five-year-old, uh, Lissy, she's five, um, she's fairly recently discovered, but she was there. We can remember her being there when we were five years old. So, you know, it's, she's there historically. Um, but she's not really a trauma holder. She's a, she used to deal with our dog. And, um, so we decided to become a dog sitter. And, nice. um, so Lissy helps take care of the dogs. She really loves animals. She loves taking care of the dogs. Um, and she, for some reason, she's the only Chris's that likes housekeeping. So it's good because <laughs> we, we're in somebody else's house taking care of their animals. So we got to clean up after ourselves and after the animals. So it's really good that she likes to do that because we needed at least one of us that liked doing that. <laughs> so <laughs> lately, you know, since we're, we're house sitting and dog sitting more, Lissy has been front more often. So she's one of the major fronts at the moment. Um, and then... Um, we're doing a lot more advocacy work. We're doing mental health advocacy and, and physical disability advocacy because we're on the board of directors of a disability agency here in the Hudson Valley. But we're also, um, we're also doing more online advocacy for people with DID and plurals overall. So um, Buck, apparently, uh, he's one of our male um, okay. headmates. And... He's been out front a lot lately. So it's been the Lissy and Buck show for about a year mm -hmm. with other people having cameo appearances. But most of the time, and, and right now we're not Buck, but, <laughs> but most of the time it's, you know, it's been um, the Lissy and Buck show. So it's been very weird going from like a 24-year-old or so guy to a five-year-old child, you know, a five-year-old girl, um, back and forth. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's... Um... I find it I, really fascinating. I hope that's not like doesn't make doesn't sound like really rude or offens like offensive. I just find it really fascinating, the you know the way it works. And it sounds like you've got like with the subcommittees and the meetings, you seem to have come up with like I think you said. Would you say thirty years of yeah since you first sort of introduced yourselves to each other. So you've come up with different ways to, you know, to manage it and to what works best for, for all you and and the headmates to best manage, you know, manage the manage your life and yeah, do the so, things that you like doing. Yeah, just to make it clear, um, we um, we are co-conscious. We're happy as a group. We still have some um, trauma holders that we're working on onboarding, you know, and bringing them into co-consciousness. Uh, we're working on being ready to hear the trauma that they have to share and things like that, which is why we're not in a rush. Um, but we are actively in therapy now. A lot of that 30 some odd years, we didn't have a therapist because of various things, you know, health insurance issues, so on. Um, but we didn't have a therapist, but we or were always working on uh, getting along better. So we're... Um, we're working together really, really well and really smoothly. So our DID portion of the, the issue, the people problem, is not as much of a problem for us as the PTSD. So for us, we're really working in therapy on the PTSD and the trauma work. Um, so other systems may have more trouble with the DID portion, with the getting along, with the amnesia, um, and so on. We're, we're having much less of a problem with that than we are with the memories, the trauma and working through the, 
the PTSD reactions. Um, so we're not healed, we're not cured, we're not even ready to be, um, you know, out in the world on our own completely, only because we had such a large gap without therapy and working on that trauma. Yeah, okay. That's, like I say, I feel like, you know, I really have enjoyed chatting today. I found it really interesting. And I feel like I have understand it a bit better, well, a lot better than I did an hour ago. So I'm really grateful. Chris, thank you for so much for coming on. Um, thank you. I was, well, there was one more thing I wanted to ask you. Um, and the re I wasn't going to ask it, but um, I saw I, in one of the videos I watched, the, the guy asked it at the end, and I was interested in your response. So in my head, I've got an idea of what I think you'll say. And I'm just interested in just, you know, I've spoken to you for an hour. So I don't know, but just um, so if someone, a doctor, whoever could said to you, they could magically take away your DID completely tomorrow and it would be, you know, it would be gone um, and the system would be gone and you would be like a singular person. Would you do that? I wouldn't because I don't know who I would be. Uh, there's no like, there's no host. So we're, we're a group entity. Yeah. And so like, who, who would that be? Would it be Buck? Would it be, you know, it's like, who, who would it be? Would it be Lissy? Would it be Buck? We, we don't have a one person to become again. We don't have any memory of ever being one person. Okay, cool. Good. Aunt I think that's a good way to, uh, to finish off. Um, I think, you are absolutely more than welcome to come on and do another show in the future. I'd really, you know, I'd really enjoy it if you could, uh, if you could find the time maybe. Um, awesome. Thank you. Obviously, DID is, you know, it's a hugely, hugely complex uh, subject um, and condition, which means, like I said earlier, I'm not going to sort of be able to discuss every little part of it, but we wanted to give people a better understanding and perhaps just educate people raise awareness of the difficulties that you guys you know you face on a daily basis um and i didn't even get to some of the questions i was gonna you know i was gonna get to but that's okay we can we can do that next time perhaps um so tell the people again where your what your website was and your twitter handle Okay, I can be found at kinhost.org. That's K I N H O S T.org. And my Twitter handle is um, the Chris's, actually, all one word T H E C R I S S E S. Thank you very much. Um, guys, you can find me on Twitter at acecast underscore nation and facebook.com slash acecast nation. Uh, the video versions of the shows will be up on youtube.com slash podcast nation and the audio, like I said before, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, all the usual places. Um, thank you so much to the Chris's for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having us, really. It's been really cool. Thank you. And uh, I, I really appreciate you finding the time to, uh, to answer my questions. Um, and like I say, you're welcome back absolutely any time. Um, guys, give this video a thumbs up, share, and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Yes.